I'm Robert Cavuto, and today on Metal Rules, we are speaking with Mickey D of Scorpions and, of course, Motorhead to talk about the re-release of Motorhead's last album, Bad Magic, Seriously Bad Magic, that came out at the end of February. So, Mickey, thank you so much. Really excited to talk to you. Thank you. All right. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. So this this release must be a little bit bittersweet for you because it came out when uh, it was being written and created when Lemmy was pretty ill. Uh, what's your thoughts on that whole aspect, but he wasn't feeling so great? Well, you know, it, it was its ups and downs. I mean, he wasn't he wasn't that bad at that time. I mean, he had some good days and some bad days, but uh, most of the time we really worked hard in the studio and and he kept it up really well you know uh so it was it wasn't a huge problem because he as i said in earlier interviews if me and phil put in you know 150 percent to this record let me put in 250 percent and yeah. he kind of stepped up and played great and yeah then of course there was a few days where he didn't feel like you know, playing too much. So, but overall, it, it was good. It was a good session. It was a great, great recording session, the way I remember everything, you know. His voice sounded so strong. You would never know he's sick. Swedish tobacco. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> you would never yeah. know, you never know he was sick with his, vo his voice, his quality was fantastic. Very strong. Yeah. It, 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 the way we knew that everything was going, we knew it was going to be not the same as always, you know. It'll, it'll be a bit of a struggle here, maybe. But he surprised us all. I mean, because we recorded Bad Magic live, as I said a million times, and Cameron Webb wanted us to really uh, do this record live together. And, and we all agreed that the question is, can we can we do that? You know, yeah. At this, and uh, uh, when Lemmy was, he was he was probably before me and Phil getting to the studio, and was so excited and and you know ready to go that we just go all right. Let's. <laughs> so when when he was actually there and playing and we played, it, we didn't think about you know him being a bit of a sick. We just cranking it, and and he did great, you know. Yeah, you know it has um two new songs on it, I guess. Bullet to your brain and greedy bastards, and of course the Bowie's cover of Heroes that didn't come out till after he passed away. Um, was that Heroes recorded during the sessions with Bad Magic? Yes, because we were we were kind of done. <clears throat> or done. I mean, we had a, a few extra days booked in the studio. Uh, and we were not done early, but we we had more days booked, and uh, then we said we let's make a couple of uh, cover tracks or something, you know, and and just use the time we had some time over, and that's one of them. And Lemmy wasn't too keen on doing that. He said, "Wow, I don't I don't want to destroy David Bowie's song and." Uh, I have to say it was Phil that insisted that we give it a shot. And it turned out to be one of his favorite songs <laughs> that we did, you know, because yeah. he did a, all of us did great on that song and the Rolling Stones song, I'd say. Yes, yeah. I think the Bowie one is more famous. I mean, it, it, it was just a fantastic song. And I guess uh, it felt so right for him to sing it and, you know, to hear it after his passing. Do you know yeah. why? Do you know why it was held back and not put on? Uh, yes, I do, because we we couldn't fit it because of the vinyl space, you know. Oh, wow. There, there's a limit to what you can put on each side of, you know, that yeah. it, the quality of the record will go down. Uh, so that song was just, you know, left behind a little bit. Yeah. And I'm glad he did. I mean, it's not a Motorhead song, and we just made a cover of it and we kind of motorized it. Same as the Rolling Stones. So we, we did a motorhead version of these songs. We're not trying to sound like mm -hmm. Rolling Stones or David Bowie, because that'd be ridiculous. Uh, we could never do it and we had no intent to do it. 
So we just wanted to make a Motorhead version of these songs. And, you know, nothing can replace the original stuff that they did, you know, sure. but we liked the songs and we wanted to, to give it a shot. And that's what we did. No, I'm glad you did. You know, it, it came out at a great time, unfortunately, after he passed, but it, it's, it's very poignant for what he was all about and fits him well. You know, I, I spoke with Phil um, a couple of about a month or so back, and he was talking about the last show in Berlin back in 2015. Um, you guys were playing and you had no idea that that was going to be your last show together ever. And he said he never really got to say goodbye to, 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 to Lemmy properly. Um, and because he passed away very shortly afterwards. Did you ever get to contact Lemmy in between the last show and when he, before he passed? Uh, yes, I did. Because I, I, I've been kind of putting the set list together uh -huh. uh, or, or at least come with the suggestions. Uh, and and uh, so what we should play. So... Right after the show in Berlin, I went to Lemmy and said, go back to L.A. Obviously, that's what he was doing. Mm -hmm. But when you come home, go through Bad Magic and see what other maybe two songs that you think we should play. Because let's drop the ones we did for the first leg of the European tour. And let's do two other songs that we have not played. Right. Uh, or at least take a look at it, see what you feel like playing, you know, because we were limited in what to do. We dropped Kill by Death, for instance, because uh, the vocal's so high and there's so much vocal in there that Lemmy had a problem breathing, you know. And uh, a young 20 year old have a problem playing that song. So <laughs> <laughs> we had no problem. And, uh, and then I did call him. Uh, a little while after, just maybe a week after, I called him and pretty much said the same thing. Just check on what you think we should start with uh, in January when we hook up. In, if if we should even change, but mm -hmm. is there any songs that you feel like we should do, or maybe change one song or something right, right. on the second leg when? And we were coming to the UK and he said, yeah, all right, I'll check it out. And I said, just rest up and eat a lot. I told him to eat like a pig. <laughs> a lot of pasta because he lost so much weight, you know. And yeah. I said, you need your energy back. And just, you know, shovel food in now for a couple of weeks and be lazy and, you know, fucking just... Add some weight, and, and we see you in the uh, in UK. Yeah. So, but that wasn't that was not a goodbye. It was just basically preparing like in case you were going to change a song. That all three of us agreed on that, and then we could pre learn it kind of or, or listen to it. So we were ready to to play it maybe for a couple of sound checks or something, and then put it in the set. Right, right. That's you know, that's what you do with that. But. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's that's a shame. It was just like more like I'll see you later than anything else. I get yeah, it. Yeah, much. But I think that's that that's the best way to do it. I mean, to say goodbye, that that would have been too fucking hard. <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay. We said see you later and, and uh, rest up. And we see you in, in Europe. You know, see you in London. Yeah. start off again and that's pretty much what, what we all said well you know the cd the release of seriously bad magic um it has a it has a live version in 2015 from mount fuji japan so that's a really wonderful thing for the fans to have and i really enjoyed that live version hearing that and it's very poignant to one of what capturing one of lemmy's last shows so th that's great too to have that yeah it is and and uh I've been saying this since day one here, doing press about this because I've seen some idiots commenting about how bad we are doing this, try to make money out of a you know dead band and Lemmy's turning in his grave and shame on you. And it's not a lot, but 
this, this has nothing to do with money. This is to prolong the Motorhead era. And we're giving our real fans another option to, to get something, <clears throat> trying to damn us to make a, a, a very collectible uh, and, and, you know, seriously put together item from us to you, basically. And there's, <laughs> there's it cost us more than it, it, it actually, it doesn't give any money to it. So, you know, I say shame on, on you, idiots out that, that has no clue about it. It's not many, but I wanted to, to come across about that because when, when we add something, you know, releasing the lost tapes or, or, I mean, Jesus, it's cost us more than we ever will see back, you know. Right. And what we do to just prolong the Motorhead era, the, the history of the, the Motorhead deal, you know. Yeah. This, this is the Lemmy legacy, and, and we're just working on it. Yep. Because there is still a demand from the real fans. Absolutely. To Motorhead. And also, we have a chance to do million interviews from a band that really doesn't exist anymore, you know, that, that which is very, very unique. Yeah. That the interest is still very much there. And uh, from us that are still left behind and uh, from everybody out there, they want to hear about Motorhead. They want to see some some new stuff. They, they haven't got enough of Motorhead, you know. Right. Yeah, I think uh, don't let the don't let the bad apples spoil it for the fans. You know, if you no, look at uh, Facebook and you look on Twitter, there are so many hardcore fans out there that love still love Lemmy. And I think it's wonderful that you're keeping his memory alive, you're keeping him alive, and you're keeping the band to some respect alive. And I think mm -hmm. that's fantastic. And it sounds great. It's a it's a killer album. And if you missed it in 2015, pick it up now because it's it's got even better more tracks on it. It's it's even better. It is, and it's a different you know, packaging and, right. and you know, a lot of young people out there did not have a chance to see us live or even old people as well. Yeah. <laughs> but but here we can give them something and, and this is what we try to do. And of course, quality could be a little off here and there, but it's rock and roll and it's raw and it's real. And, and yeah. we, we value that more than a perfect digital bullshit record you know uh, yep. with with a bunch of fake shit on it and that's just not motorhead and so so that's uh, that's where we're at but yeah. i like to mention that uh because it it does irritate me a bit with uh these knuckleheads that just don't see it you know they just right. don't see it. and uh well, you know, we're giving people an option here, and that's it. They don't have to buy shit if they don't want to. And they can think whatever they want about, you know, prolonging the Motorhead le legacy. If they want Motorhead buried, they, they can bear them with themselves, you know. But we are not going to do it. Right. It's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. You get a, you always get a couple of idiots doing something yeah. stupid uh, just to get attention. You know, when, when Lemmy passed... Um, after the shock kind of, of it wore off, what was your concern about your next steps and your next career move? Were you worried at any point going, oh my God, uh, I don't have a band now? No, it, it, it's not worrying me. It didn't worry me. But of course you start to think more in the direction of where do I wanna be? Do I wanna step off the big stage? Uh, after almost 40 years myself, since the King Diamond days, and yeah. thousands and thousands of shows with different bands. And uh, do I want to step down from the big stage? I mean, play drums, I will do my whole life, of course, but yeah. on one way or the other. So it, it doesn't worry me, but what kind of irritates you, though, is that you feel, or I feel, that I play better drums today than I've done ever in my life, you know, yeah. because I, I have much more experience and I'm I'm dead calm in how to approach records and touring and and so you, you obviously 
or is more easygoing. You're not as as a hothead as you probably were in the early days, and everything's kind of flowing. So when you you're supposed to bite into that nice apple and more enjoy the ride, then it might be over. You know. Right. So that's that's not worrying. It's more where do I want to put myself in what division? Uh, and I thought about that, yes, of course, but I didn't have to think very long before the scorps called me. So wow, it, we're talking weeks. <laughs> oh, geez. Did um did you have to audition, or did they just give you the job? I mean, you, I mean, you're a fantastic drummer. You, but just to get along with the guys, or to make sure yeah. they're comfortable with the material. They called me in to be a stand-in for maybe James. Uh, just be because they started to uh, get tired of his problems. So they said, look, if you can be a stand-in on, on the parts of the European tour. Uh, I said, yeah, no problem. So, but at mean, meanwhile, while I was secretly following the band around in Germany, we were rehearsing a couple of times secretly. Wow. And I'm sure that they wanted to check me out there, of course, you know, and yeah. and and you never know how things are gonna go with the social part or the, the musical part, but they loved it immediately. And and my idea was to uh show them what they cannot be without, basically, you know. Yeah. Jay is a great drummer. He did fantastic with Scorpions. He ran into some health problems that he had to deal with. So I'm never, I, I was never, and I will never talk him down any way, shape, or form. But what I would like to do, what I wanted to do at that point, was to show what I can do yeah, and what you cannot be without. I said to the guys that I'm going to motorize them, you know. <laughs> I want it harder, tighter, and heavier. And uh, I'm going to show you what kind of drummer I am. Right. I'm going to try to put the much more energy into what we do. And, uh, and hopefully that will contaminate the whole band and we can take it to another level and I can inspire enough to you guys and you will inspire me as well of course because playing pretty much the same stuff for 25 years is right. is one thing so this was a big challenge for me of course as well and I believe exactly that it was the same feeling joining Motorhead that we were both kicking each other's asses for a while. Yeah. And road, you know, I inspired them and they inspired me. And and when that works out the way it did with Motorhead and now again with Scorpions, it's a good thing, you know? Yes, I agree. And they have no attitude. I have no attitude. We, we knew each other before. We get along great. And, uh, and now we're just gonna play great together. And uh, but of course, it's what you say. You never, ever, ever know. Right. I might be an idiot getting getting out there with scorpions, being a complete prick about stuff, and they go, "Holy shit, we don't remember you like this," you know. <laughs> I might think that, "Holy smoke, these guys are fucking morons. I can't deal with this." Yeah. Well, that, but that was not the case. And of course. We got along great, and uh, and we still do, and we're having a blast on the road and in the studio. Yep. So it turned out to be a win-win situation. And uh, I, I think you're a fantastic addition to the band. Uh, I've seen you countless times, and I told you in New York City when I saw you play Madison Square Garden for that that benefit show. Oh, yeah, was, with I've seen the Scorpions every time they come around. And that was by far one of my favorite times of seeing the Scorpions. I thought you guys were on fire that night. Yeah, it, it, it is a lot of energy. It is a great show. Mm -hmm. um, I believe everybody stepped up, you know? Yeah. I mean, I consider myself as a goalie. You know, I'm a hockey freak, of course. Yeah. And, I play yeah. and I talked to, to a lot of goalies, pro 
professional guys and we have so much in common, you know, because if I'm steady back here, if I, I'm holding the sticks, I'm telling these guys where we are on stage. They yeah. feel sure with me back there. They can relax and do their, their stuff, you know, yeah. much, much better. Yeah. I mean, when Finland, Sweden played a game, Finland was up 5-1. And their first goalie got injured. So they had to put in the second goalie. Mm -hmm. And I remember talking to Yanni Ninema about this because we won the game 6-5. And they said they didn't really, they, they didn't really trust the second goalie. And he got injured as well, so they put in the third goalie. And he was obviously not what they wanted to have. So the whole team pretty much collapsed. And that's the same on stage. If they if if they feel that I'm secure, I'm I'm doing fuck ups and you know, maybe sluggish or whatever it is, they they're gonna look at me, they're gonna hear me. I cannot make fuck ups and I never do fuck ups. That's what I always say. I never do mistakes on stage. And that's pretty ballsy to say yeah. that. Yeah. But I don't. I don't. Out of several hundred shows now with Scorpions, I fucked up maybe twice that I know. <laughs> and, and one time, <clears throat> my click track went out. My box blew up. So I had nothing to go. I just played the song. Obviously, I was not in perfect time with the guys because they were looking at me going, what the hell? <laughs> I have to have the click as a reference for the production that we have. Yeah. When up and stuff. It's not for me really to follow, but I have it as a reference, which is fine. I play around it. Yeah. But, uh, but that time was chaos for me because... We have no amps on stage. Yes. So it's quiet. I have no idea what's going on. So I, before they fixed that, I knew I was way off in time. So <laughs> that's one fuck up that I know that I did. And another. And it wasn't up, your fault. What? And it wasn't your fault that the click track went It wasn't your fault. And then there was one more time that I actually did fuck up. But then I broke a drumstick in a drum fill, a left stick, and I kind of stumble. Usually I don't. I can always cover that. But I remember doing a a pretty bad drum fuck up. <laughs> that's <laughs> twice out of maybe, I don't know, 400 shows. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. You know, you alluded to earlier that you were secretly following the Scorpions around. Were you at the shows when James was playing and was he aware that you were there? I saw every single show because I had to sit and learn the set. Yeah. And I was sitting secretly up on the arena. You know, usually they have it blocked off. If you draw a line on the short side of an arena, the stage, and then backwards, it's never open for the public. Right. I had to sit very, very far way up there uh, within ears so I could hear what was going on and... Uh, he knew that there was a drummer, not who it was. Yeah. Uh, and he played great. I mean, he yeah. shaped up and, and and played fine. And then I went back to Sweden. And then I got a call just right after the European tour. And they said, look, can you finish out the year? And I said, absolutely, because I'm doing nothing. Right. Uh, and then I realized, I realized at that time that he's not coming back, you know, right, right. because uh, we already did some rehearsals and I showed him kind of what they cannot be without. I was hoping, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, but he did great. And then obviously he kind of lost, lost it there a little bit. And, and you can't live everybody else's life, of course. So, right. right. Uh, um, um, uh, I was not there to to snag his seats uh, in Scorpions, but they had to do something, and that's what they choose to do. And here I was. 
I guess. But I already, I already at that point had said yes to do six or eight shows with the Lizzie. Scott Gorham called me. Yeah. And they would go out that summer as Thin Lizzie, not as Black Star Writers. Right. And I said yes to that. So I had to turn them down later because I realized this will be more than just six shows, you know. And uh, so I had to unfortunately um, say no to to do that summer. Right. This is one of my favorite bands through all, all time. So I was very, very happy to get the call. And uh, that was actually before Scorpion. So we're talking at the same time as I actually was at the ceremony with Lemmy's funeral. Wow. Well, they, they were excusing themselves big time for calling so early, of course, but, but they needed to know because they were looking, they had to know if I was interested or if they had to look for someone else. Right. And uh, I believe I was helping them out to get uh, Scott Travis to actually, he did that. Right. Little talk. He did fantastic, what I understand. So yeah. it turns out great. You know, when I met you in New York that time, um, you know, we talked a little bit about this album. And with the new rock album, Rock Believers album, you play songs that you created. How is that different than playing the songs that were created before your time? It must be exciting. Yeah, it is. But at the same time, I'm trying to. Uh, I try to create my own style in each of these drum, I mean, old tracks. And that's where, that's a good question because what I believe that I have now is that finger top tip feel, what to change and not to change. And if I go back to Motorhead, I said to the press and, and to, I was pretty cocky when I joined the band because I had to be a little bit cocky right. with the fact that either I'd be a filthy animal tailor replacement or I would put Mickey D on the map. I'm going to change the music. I will change the direction of Motorhead. And I choose obviously the second option there. And uh, at, But at the same time, Filthy did a lot of kind of drum fills that were a little bit of trademarky stuff in songs. It's not what I would have played if I created the song from scratch. Right. I had to keep those mm. drum fills. And then at the same time, add some Mickey D into it. Mm -hmm. And I could, have I could have destroyed Motorhead if I wanted to <laughs> by, by putting in all kinds of fucked up chops and technical shit and, and say, hey, look how good I am. You know what I mean? And and I did not, of course, want to do that. I wanted to keep Motorhead's simplicity and fist in your face, your black picture. But I wanted to put some color here and there. So so to keep some of Taylor's filth, fills and, and to add me into it as well, and that's a fine line there. And that's what I have to do with Scorpions as well. Right. I try to, to keep some of, of Herman's classic stuff in there. Right. I don't want to change that because they sound great and they fit perfect with Scorpions. Yes. But at the same time, I like to add a bit of color and or more put me into it, you know. So that's and, right. and for that, you need that little extra fingertip in Sweden we have the same if you have the fingertip feeling I don't know if you have that in the US yeah. at all but, but that you know that tweak that little sensitive tweak you could easily cross the line and and I can overplay some of these Scorpion songs and only do Mickey D in there and people don't recognize some of these drum fills that they air drumming to whatever and they go oh man you know, rock you like a hurricane. You want to hear these booms where they're supposed to be. Yeah. You want some of these simple, very nice, tasteful drum fills. 
And uh, I try to keep those in there, but at the same time, adding myself into it. Now, that's a great point of view. You know, for people just starting out to play the drums or to play any instrument, um, can you share the importance of being um, versatile and learning many different styles of music? Because you, you've been in the heavy metal hard rock genre, but from, you know, King Diamond to Scorpions, Motorhead, they're all a little different and they all have their nuances. So tell us about the impact from your success as being a drummer related to your versatility. Well, that has to do with if you're interested or not in, in different kinds of music. Right. I, mean, not, I, I don't say everyone, but a lot of musicians, not necessarily drummers, but musicians in general, mm. they very, very narrow-minded. They yeah. just love what they are doing, basically. And I've never been there. I, I, I love jazz. I love fusion. I love wow. soul favorite bands is level 42 you know wow i fucking love level 42 and i love toto and i love uh, brian adams i love tina turner i love big big band jazz i like soul uh my favorite female singer whitney houston you know uh, you know everything that it's not just hard rock or heavy metal and, and when I listen to music, I, I listen to so many different drummers and the and, and way musicians in general approach their music. And it's not that I want to be the best anywhere. I never wanted that ever. And Rush, of course, one of my favorite bands. Yeah, I can imagine. I don't want to be the best at all anywhere. I just want to be a very decent drummer across the board but uh, to be able to go up with a with with a band like you know level 42 and do a good job i mean what gary husband's playing on there is insanely good you know i like to play with earth wind and fire you yeah. know i like to play uh, with acdc just just a solid beat i would love to do a uh, Tom Sawyer with Rush or Exanadu, you know, and I love to play with Scorpions. I like to keep them motivated. I like to play with Ramones or Sex Pistols, you know. Right. I like to sit and play some traditional great big band jazz. Uh, not that I do it that much, but at least I got the interest for it. And I've been sucking on that little, you know, popsicle here and there. And enough to to enjoy it, you know. And yeah. And if you if you take all these ingredients, spices into one big soup, minestrone soup, you get Mickey D, I guess. You know, and that's what I like, you know, because when I've been jamming with some of these session drummer, I mean musicians, and there might be like a fusion song or a almost little maybe Latino song or. And they go, holy shit, you, you sound fucking great here on this, you know? And, and, and that is enough for me. I don't want to be best anywhere. I just want to be a good drummer across the board. But then my heart is in the hard rock. Yeah. That's where my heart is. And that's where, I mean, that's like food or air. I, I got to have it every day, me you know? Me too. Uh, the rest of the music are, spices that that inspire me still to this day but so i guess that's the best explanation i can no that's that's incredibly insightful and i think that's a fantastic insight for people who are learning to play an instrument or want to expand they need to they need to learn a little bit of everything know a little bit of everything and find their own voice regardless of what that instrument is i believe so it's, nice. it's so hard to play out of your comfort zone, you know, you, yes. you get out. I mean, I can go up anywhere and play rock tunes, it feels like today. And and I'll, I'll be decent there, you know, I'll be good. Yeah. But once I step out of my comfort zone, it's a challenge. And I'm so grateful still to this day, turning 60 this year, that I see challenges ahead of me, you know. Right, right. I'm not 
back this comfortable Lamborghini chair and, and go that I know everything there is. I, I really, really, really don't, you know. I, I learn every single day and as long as I do that and be humble about it, it I'm going to do fine. That's how I feel it. You're fantastic. The back, well, the second you sit back and go, I'm a great fucking drummer. I, I, <laughs> I don't to rehearse this. I don't, you know, you're in dangerous. You're on thin ice, really. Yes, yes. Uh, I learn every single day. And I play back here in Sweden. I do sessions all over the place. I'm going to go in the studio tomorrow and record couple of songs completely different from what I'm doing. Wow. And and I, I I done a record last year for another band and and I do a lot of live stuff with with other musicians and that keeps me on my edge, you know. That's physically great. but most of all mentally. Hockey keeps me physically all right. <laughs> but mentally I'm thinking drums I'm thinking different in, in this type of music that I have to play. I have to learn how to adjust. I keep my synopsis firing off, you know, in, in a different way than when I'm sitting in my comfort zone. Right. That's great. You know, from King Diamond to Motorhead to the Scorpions, at what point in your career? Well, you're missing Don Dockton. Yes, uh, one of my favorite albums, Up From the Ashes. I love that. I have a question about that. But at what point did you find that you, you felt that you had made it? At, at what point in your career did you make it? I, 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 I never thought those thoughts, really, ever. Um, I do remember how I thought beginning of King Diamond. And that's the only time I think I was thinking about in this in this way is that when I joined King, I thought the train's coming in for me now. I have to prepare for a great record and for a, my first world tour, US beginning of the Fatal Portrait Tour. And I said, I, I want to come to US and I want to sound great. So I was practicing six, eight hours a day. Uh, I took it very seriously because at that time I felt maybe I have a shot at it here. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to uh, come prepared for that. And that's the only time that I actually thought in this, this way. Yeah. And then of course, time's just been rolling. King Diamond, I left King 88. Uh, I was sad by doing that, but it was not for me anymore at that time for several reasons I spoke about a million times. Um, but I decided to leave because it was not what we set out to do from the beginning. Mm -hmm. we, were, we were five friends that had a blast. And at this time, we were really not uh, having that much fun anymore. So I left the band because I only stayed with the band as long as I think it's funny or I enjoy it, you know. Right. I don't know if it's the biggest band in the world. And then uh, joined on and that was the perfect high school <laughs> because I felt very narrow as a drummer at that time. Yeah. Um, suddenly I was sitting, rocking out, playing Hunter and, you know, uh, in my dreams and try to rock out being steady. I had to work hard on my meter uh, and, and not to have stress in my heart. I could do, I mean, I'm coming from a band where I did back beats and technical drum fills and, you know, every bar had something weird going on and here I'm just gonna sit and rock out. Yeah. yeah. Simple. And that's very hard when you're stressed in your heart, you know. Uh, so that was perfect to go to Dawn. I, I wanted to play some more melodic stuff. Yeah. Unfortunately, that didn't last for more than a couple of years. I know. Because it kind of just ran out. And uh, and let me call it again, third or the fourth time, 
about joining the band and it, it came just perfect timing. Yeah. Because at that time I realized I said, no, I belong in the heavier di division, you know. Yeah. This is what I want to do. And uh that was a huge challenge. And I'm so glad I turned him down. But it sounds bad turning Motorhead down, but <laughs> I was just not ready for Motorhead in 1986. I didn't yeah. feel I earned my stripes yet to join a band like Motorhead. And and we were a bunch of friends in King Diamond. I was happy in that band, yeah. our band. That's why I said no to Lemmy. But I, of course, I didn't say, no way, I would never join Motorhead. You know, I said, it's insane to get the question. But I don't think I'm ready for you guys, basically, you know. Oh, wow. And uh, we kept contact over the years. Yeah. And let me and, and me and Phil and Versal, we, we, we kept contact. And then they asked me again, and that was bad timing, I remember. The third time, I believe, let me ask me was right before we going out on almost a 12-month tour with Don. Right. And I said, look... <clears throat> At that point, I said, I would, you know, possibly join the band, but I'm not going to jump the ship here yeah, right yeah. before the tour. And I'm glad I didn't because I, 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 I learned a lot from that year of touring with, with the band that we were. And I guess, I guess that was the fourth time. And he came in just right time. He let me said, what are you doing? And I was actually on my way back to Sweden. I lived in California then and said I might go back for six months and lick my wounds basically because yeah. this has said before you go lick your your fucking wounds come and record a couple of songs with us. Yeah. <laughs> I said, Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. And that's when we start talking again. And you know, I, Up From the Ashes, Don Dock and Up From the Ashes is one of my all-time favorite albums. It's one of those ones that if you or on a desert island, I would want to take with me because I love that album so much. Was that band a, a band that was expected to go further or was it just a super group that was more of a project for Don? No, this, this was a band uh, that it was called Don Dawkin. Right. Was not Don's suggestion. Don did not want it to be called Don Dawkin. But he was not allowed to use Dokken. Right. They were in a dispute, if I remember right, about yeah, the name. Yeah, that's right. And uh, the record company insisted on calling it to keep Dokken in there. He was allowed to use Don Dokken. Yeah. Right. So that's he asked us. I mean, very free. And he said, "Look, you know, what do you guys think about this?" And, and we kind of thought the same thing as the record company said, we're fine with that, Don. He said, this is not my solo project. This is, I want to get a band. He got Peter Baltus, John Norum, Billy White, and myself. And we were a new band. Okay. Uh, just like George Lynch uh, started his band, you know? Yep. Uh, so... Uh, it just turned out that way. And uh, it was supposed to go way further, of course. Yeah. But grunge hit big time. And that kind of tilted, killed this kind of music a little bit in Los Angeles, at least. Yeah. You know, like Tesla, Warrant, you know, Skid Row, Rat, Dokken, you know, all these bands started to struggle because grunge took over big time, you know? Right, right. Well, Mickey, I want to thank you so much for your time. It was an honor to speak with you. It was well worth the wait to speak with you. It was a fascinating interview. Uh, and I, I love the Scorpions, one of my all time favorite bands. They, and I'm such a, ha I'm so happy you're part of it. You're such a great fit. So congratulations. And I yeah, hope thank you. you uh, New, Jer New Jersey or New York again. I'm, I'm glad you came to see that kind of awkward Bangladesh government put that yeah. show we i was right no at the end of the catwalk i had a beautiful seat i had a beautiful seat it was an amazing amazing show we had no clue what to expect from that yeah and then we played the 
uh, the UBS Arena, I think it's called, right? Yeah. Long Island. Yeah, you played Long Island, yes. But but that's kind of far away, though, isn't it? You know, it's not Madison Square. Right. So I, I hope we do Madison next time. Smack in the center. Right. Uh, and sell it out like we did the time before. Yep. But uh, I believe the it was a little too close to that Bangladeshi show in May, I believe. And then we're yeah. coming back right after the summer and do Long Island, you know. So yeah. uh, hopefully next next time there'll be Madison Square Garden. Yep, I saw, I, saw, I saw your list past, I think it was September in Atlantic City. Okay. That was a great show, another great show too. Did we play Atlant Yo, Atlantic City, yes. Yes, yeah, Atlantic City, yeah. Yeah, at that casino. Yes, yes. Atlantic City, yeah, I remember that casino. I think it was September. I don't know if I have my, my dates wrong, I've, I'm sorry. Yeah, it, it was in September. Yeah. Because we, we followed up and did the US tour. We did the residency in Vegas in uh, March, April. Right. Uh, and then we came back after Europe and, and started the full US tour, which was great. I, I love touring uh, over in the US, you know. Yeah. We had big shows and it's a great audience. Uh, but now we got to do South America and Europe up till mid July. That's what I know now. Okay. Well, hopefully you come back to the United States and I get to see you guys play. I, I will be there. Mickey, well, thank you so much for your time. Awesome interview. Thank you so much. Uh, thank Have you. Have a great day. Take care, bud. Bye bye. Bye bye.